Hey guys, this is And The Writer Is, and I'm your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of writers and artists over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life and the industry, politics, composition, whatever. If you ask me, songwriters are some of the most worldly and intelligent people I've ever come across. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. Now, I'm co-producing this with my friend Joe London, who was nominated for a Grammy earlier this year for Best Country Song. He makes us sound like angels. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, go to Spotify and look up our playlist, And The Writer Is, or go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. Oh, and if you enjoy this podcast, please rate us on iTunes or whatever your preferred podcast listening site is. We really appreciate that effort. This week's episode is with Allie Tamposi. She has the number two song on Top 40 Radio. It's Kygo's It Ain't Me featuring Selena Gomez. So we're really proud of her because when you hear this story, you're going to hear her roller coaster ride from being at literally the top, going literally to the bottom, and then literally back up to the top. Needless to say, this is going to be a very entertaining episode. But before we get to that, I wanted to talk about song math. Song math is essentially modern song composition. I mean, it hasn't changed all that much since Franz Schubert in the early 1820s. But without going to a history lesson of song composition and sonata form, the gist of it is that songs need to be somewhat symmetrical. There needs to be some sort of arc. I think there are three arcs. There's a melodic arc, a rhythmic arc, and a lyric arc. So when you talk about a melodic arc, as my friend Colby Clay once said, you start low and you end high. It's about framing titles. It's about framing all lyrics. Is there an antagonist as a listener? Is there a protagonist as a listener? The gist of it is that this is a very complicated conversation that we're not going to have in this intro. But we will get to process and composition at a later point on a separate kind of episode. Let's not worry about that now. In the meantime, here is And the Writer Is featuring... Ali Tamposi. Welcome to And the Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Since she entered the game, today's guest has written three of the biggest songs in music. Her discography includes some of the greatest singers of our generation, Christina Aguilera, Kelly Clarkson, and Demi Lovato. Some of the biggest DJs of our generation, DJ Snake, Kygo, and Cedric Gervais. And some of the biggest pop stars of our generation, including Justin Bieber, Selena Gomez, and my favorite, herself. From West Palm Beach, Florida, this writer is only beginning her journey as she's knocking on the door of her third number one pop record, Kygo's It Ain't Me, featuring Selena Gomez. The writer is my 2012 Aspen writing camp buddy, Allie Tamposi. I feel like the mariachi band should come in now. It's like, ding, 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 ding. Is that a mariachi band? That's awesome. Um... A one man so you're s- so you're still singing demos for still singing demos for some I mean, some yeah, side cash. Yeah, you know you got to do what you got to do. Do people ask you like, yo, can you sing demos? Like, when did that no. stop? What was the moment where that stopped? Well, I don't feel like I, I actually don't feel like I started becoming a good singer until like the last until I really discovered how to work with auto tune, and then like I I feel like I'm I'm the most confident auto tune singer there is without it. I mean, it's a different story. It's a different person. It's a different song. It's crazy. It's so vulnerable to sing without autotune in an era where you're used to listening to autotune. Yeah. I think people don't realize that, like, it's not as Adele's an amazing singer, but for people to assume that none of that's autocorrected in any way is just like, that's. I won't even touch a mic without the tune on full and without the CLA. I mean, I need the whole thing. And it's just like, that's the most stimulating part for me is jumping on the mic and freestyling melodies and kind of catching that flow and feeling like good about myself. Do you record vocals at home? No, I don't. I should. I mean, I went to audio engineering school, so I kind of feel like I wasted that degree. Where did you go to school? SAE. I actually went to school with, I was in the same grade as the Monsters and Strangers. Oh, cool. And the, the class, yeah, in Miami, we didn't really know each other and there's only like 30 people per grade and um, I ended up like 
flash forward three years later in a session with them. And I'm like, you guys look familiar. And they're like, yeah. And we started talking there from Miami and it, it, somehow SAE popped up. Yeah, we, were, we had the same teachers. Everything was really crazy. And they're, they're, they're utilizing their degree. And like some people, I could, I can't even. Touch no, but it, you, you just said, you know, with the CLA, and at least you know your CLA being the Chris Lord Algae plugin. Right. And you know, like, you I know, know it you works. Know, you know, I know how it works. You me. know how it works. I can't and, touch a computer. God right. forbid, ask me to put on a loop, and it's yeah. like the session crashes. It's yeah. so bad. It's yeah. embarrassing. I try and kind of leave that detail out that I actually was an engineer at some point. I don't know. I think I cheated I my that. way through that. I really did. I mean, I was too young. I was 17. Like You're from West Palm Beach, yep. right? Uh, Delray Beach, West Palm Beach. Bounced around a bit. Well, you, where, how did you... Before you're 17, are you singing in, in bands and or musical theater? Are you singing... I mean, where do you yeah, start? Because well, you're obviously a singer. Right. You know, I, are your parents singers? My dad can play the piano pretty well. My mom is not. Um... But at 14, I um, signed a production deal with Marty Cintron, who was in the band No Mercy. I think he still is in that. The, the song, Where Do You Go, My Love. Wow. So he signed me, developed me. We did a demo. And then um, he played it for Frank Farian, who is um, the voice behind Millie Vanilli. He owned a record label through How Sony. How did they find you? Uh, through my sister-in-law, who owns a modeling agency in Miami. And so she knew Marty and brought me in. And that's actually, so I owe a lot of this to Marianne, my sister-in-law, who just like was facilitating. Wow. And yeah, and so it's... it's so you have older, older siblings. Yep. I have two older brothers and a younger sister and brother. And she introduces you to them and she's in Miami. Yep. As a, And she's, you know... Calls him and says, you got to hear my little sister. She's only 14, but she's incredible. Yeah, it was perfect timing. He was looking for something to do because his band was kind of slowing down. And um, I learned, he, yeah, I learned a lot from him. He taught me how to play the guitar. And and then he brought me to his, the, to his label, which Frank Farian owned. And Frank Farian signed me to a record deal, which is crazy. So I signed a record deal we made a whole album i was actually working with styles who i don't think he goes by styles anymore but i just ran into him at jay cash's house 10 years later he um engineers and helps produce with like the weekend and billions what's his name danny deep styles i'll show you a picture later but you definitely know him um, I ran into him. We made a whole album together, did a music video. Were you writing or were they giving you songs to? I was writing. So you're writing at 14 years old? This at is this point, 14? I was 16. I signed uh -huh. the demo deal at 14. Marty wrote my songs then. And then 16, started getting into that, the writing world. It was like a pop rock record, like all on analog. It was really cool. I um, made some money then. And were those songs good? Pretty good, like I think that was a sample. Actually, I have a music video for it. It's like God. Can you look it up? Is it on YouTube? No, but I'll I'll uh I'll, that one's going away. That one's <laughs> yeah, exactly. Staying somewhere in some vault. Um, but yeah, it's and so then after about a year and a half, that started to kind of fizzle out. So why? It's just the, there wasn't. The funding, there wasn't, you know, they didn't have the right, like the... the was uh, it a record deal? Did he have a record deal signed to a major? It was, or was Sony, it... but it was like Sony Germany or something. So there was like right. just a complete disconnect. And then, so my dad was like, all right, you got to go to school. So SAE looks like it was, it was only a year and a half in Miami. It was, looked like the easiest thing to get through, which was so not the easiest thing. It was Did like, you go to high school during all this? Um, I went to, I, I actually did a uh, freshman year at a, at, um, school of the arts and then I homeschooled. Okay. After so that. you got your GED before yeah. you went and did. Mm hmm Interesting. Yeah. And then. So I'm in SAE at 17, like have no what idea. What does SAE stand for? School of Audio Engineering. Okay, right, right. That and seems logical. I mean, I, I was put that not together, prepared for that. The amount of science and math and, I mean, these kids have been working on these, on programs, Pro Tools, Reason, Logic, Cubase. 
and we were I was in there cutting tape and like I had, the final was we had to mix um live mic and mix live drums I don't know how I got through that I know I had a, I had my guys though I'd <laughs> I'd like hang out with after school to like let me like they'd tutor me and I was so stressed out. That was the most stressed out I've ever been. Because if I just was at the very end and I knew, like, if you fail your final, you fail. And you've got to go back for another six months. So I was, yeah, I made it through. Let's just say that. that was, I can't even go back there. It's just a heavy when you, place. When you finish that program and, and you are sitting there, you're like, I got, I got the certificate, but I don't have any idea how to do any of it. I went straight back into the studio. I have studio. a music degree, and I'm like, I can't read notation really for shit. I mean, I can kind of read vocal stuff, but like going through the like a music degree yeah. and being like, I mean, I guess I can Where did you go? Say, USC. USC, okay. But it was a lot of classical kids. I, just, I remember, like, side story, and I know this isn't my story, this is yours, but I had a music theory teacher who used to talk shit on pop music all the time. <laughs> And and she was a flautist, and she played in the orchestra. And I was like, "You're in a you're in a 250 year old cover band. <laughs> Nobody's going to see you play. They're going She's to see a Mozart." Flautist. I didn't know that's what it's called yeah. for a flute player. Yeah, it was a just flautist. a weird thing. I just remember saying saying, "I don't know why you're criticizing pop music," which just shows that you don't listen to pop music. And because you play flute in a in an orchestra it doesn't make you a better musician it makes you a better flautist right but a you're in, you're in a cover band like nobody's going to see you're going to see mozart you're going to see gershwin you're not going to see the second chair of right. flautist like and if you know versus trying to be the composer yourself it's a whatever that's it a whole like other that's thing. a deeper situation it seems like she's a bit bitter right exactly <laughs> a bitter flautist but at that point when you're saying okay so you get your certificate what do you do with your well i went right after that i had like another month or so left with my record deal and I was going back in, like, just give it, like, another couple of rounds in the studio, and I happened to run into... So the studio was above this towing company, this, like... What's I mean, everybody word? gets towed in, in uh, Miami. It's um, Tremont Towing, and then it was just a random studio. It Could was, you hear, like, the garages and all Not too people? bad. They put some money into it, so it was uh-huh. pretty uh, insulated. Um, but I'm outside the studio, and I was kind of like... I was a cocky little shit at 17, 18. And I was off, like, just coming from the beach, going in there. And um, I ran into, there was these two guys, and it happened to be Jim Johnson and um, Rocco from Rebel Rock. They were at Rebel Rock at that point. I don't know if they're still affiliated. but And Jim, I at at think the first glance, he's a little intimidating. I don't know if you met him. Explain who Jim Johnson is. Okay, so Jim Johnson, um, to date, he's he produced Lollipop, uh, Beyonce, Sweet Dreams. um, God, he did a Trick Daddy, Trina, Pretty Ricky, um, ASAP Rocky, huge producer. Yeah, incredible. So, uh, so Rocco and Jim came up to me. They're like, hey. You know what's going on? What are you up to? You getting your car towed? And I was like, ugh. It's like, no, I'm going to the studio. And and uh, Rock was like, yo, this is Jim Johnson. He's a big producer. I'm like, everybody's a producer. Like, come on. And he's like, no, 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 man. He's a Trina trick daddy, blah blah. blah. And I'm like, all right. And they're like, here's my card. Like, you know, get in touch if you, you know, if you're interested in meeting up or whatever. So I go up to the studio and I'm just like chilling, waiting around, and I Google rebel rock and i see like the discog and i'm like oh shit like this is real i gotta get the fuck out of this joint (laughs) and and so i called like a few hours later and rocco picked up and um i'm like hey i met you guys at the towing place um they were getting towed they weren't there for the studio no so just coincidence you're going to the studio and they're two huge like music oh yeah music people and you just and they're sitting there waiting for their car yep and you're sitting there thinking like, oh, it's, these guys can't even get into the studio above the right, place. And exactly. they're calling themselves producers. Oh, my God. It, it's Amazing. so crazy to think about because it's just like that day, that time. It's a trip. So, yeah. So I went over to the, their studio, which was like a game changer. It was like this South Beach or South Beach Studios on the beach. And I walk in and like 
there's they're making mu- like there's some music coming out of here like it just has that feel there's plaques all over the walls and um i go in and I sat down and it was kind of like an interview process i started playing the piano like cuz i just like really got good at like these five chord progressions and different ways to play it. that's all i can play <laughs> but i just nailed them still all you need right that and, flautist um, would be like, right. <laughs> really impressed with this conversation now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right, though. Yeah, so I played, and um, and uh, at that time, Jim had been working with, like, Rico Love, and he just had his crew. It was so cool thinking back, like, looking back at it, because he had, like, a live bassist there, and he had, um, you know, Frankie, who was the guitarist, and they're all, it was set up like a band, and he was on the um, MPC, and um, so, yeah, so I played some stuff, sang a few things, and, like, within a few months, I was signed to a production deal with him, and I got in. I mean, I learned so much. He brought me into, I mean, I was a rookie, like, and he brought me into, like, some big writing camps with, like, David Hodges, David Ryan Harris, Steve McEwen, Simon Wilcox, and this is, like, I mean, eighteen, nineteen area yeah so i happened to one day get <laughs> i haven't jim asked me if i wanted to do a session with him and rico and so i came in one with one of those progressions and we ended up writing a song called save the hero which was supposed to be my first single but then randomly jim called me a few days after we wrote it and he's like you know if for some reason like we you know another a bigger artist wants this record you know like, well, yeah, would you be into it? And I was like, I mean, not unless it's like Mariah Carey or fucking Beyonce. Like, I mean, anyone else I'd be like, I mean, I want to do it. Like, this is my thing. What is even being a songwriter really? Like, you're not famous. <laughs> so, um, And all you wanted to do at that point was be famous? No, I wanted to like, I just, there was this next tier of like, performing and like that just there wasn't uh, to me I I was I was still so premature and to I didn't I didn't catch those like highs that I catch now in the studio the last five years in the studio when I was 18 it was just kind of like okay cool this is the first step to like getting out there and like doing my thing I mean I was in a fucking really heavy duty relationship for a really long time at that point and this was like my ticket out of Miami and in that relationship yeah you wanted out of the relationship yeah well what was the relationship uh, I started dating my first boyfriend at um we were 14 15 he was a few years older and I was in that for a really long time and it was really really heavy yeah he why it was just really dysfunctional he came from a dysfunctional family and um, I mean, we're talking like as soon as I got my license, I was chasing him around, like looking for him at different strip clubs, different like it was just really intense. But at that point, it just that was normal to me, you know, like consistent, li- like compulsive lying. And and uh, and then he got really sick towards uh, the end, like f- five or six years in, he was diagnosed with cancer. So I'm young and I'm dealing with like going and working with Jim and then spending six hours a day in the hospital with him, you know, going through chemotherapy and all that. Did that, was that, did that normalize how crazy the the career is because you're doing something so crazy like being in a hospital or was it just like the extremes are so heavy that it it just, they both were weighing on you. Yeah, the extremes were really heavy and, and it was a, it was a shitty, I was in a really, uh, was he still difficult to be with when he was sick? Yeah, because for some reason, like right before he was diagnosed, he was, I, I knew that he had been toying with the idea of, of breaking up and he had met somebody. And I know that that was like, it was, I can't necessarily say he was, there was cheating. I know there was cheating. Yeah, there was There was a lot of that going on, but there was this one particular girl that I knew that, could potentially pull him away from me. So when he got sick, it was like, okay, he needs me now. So this is my time to like really make it work. But in his first cycle of chemotherapy, he was, you know, before he lost his hair, he was still going out and I could feel like this is really fucked up, but I still stuck with him because he, you know, he's, he doesn't have 
um, you know, he's just doesn't have a good uh, support system. And so I was there. And the second that he um, went, it took about three or four months before he was cured. Once he started to get his health back, that at that point, I just made the decision to get out and move to L.A. So when and and was that sort of so that's all one fell swoop. You have this song that and Jim's like, you know, you're you said if it's a if it's Beyonce, then you'll you'll get you yeah know, and knock so, yourself out and then and he's sick and you're trying to get out of this relationship, right? I mean, the weight of that's that one song, even if that's either your single or somebody else's, all that's going to be your ticket out. Well, you would have thought, but it. I mean, there was a lot of talk about... So Beyonce ended up cutting the record because at that time, Jim and Rico had been working with her doing, like, Sweet Dreams and all those big records. And how old were you at that point? I was 18, 19, around there. Probably 19 then, yeah. And so... How was your your ego at at 18 years old dealing with all this where you're you're now recording, writing songs for Beyonce? It was... I don't know, it was cut in half, I think. It was like, you know... I had a lot of guilt because I was trying to like enjoy it, but I needed to be there with him. And I really felt like, you know, I just, if he, if I just couldn't, the thought of him sitting there for so long alone just killed me. So I was juggling. It was a really tough time for me. I mean, but it, at that point, um, the song was, you know, there was talks that the song was going to be a single for Beyonce and then it ended up only being a bonus track, which has songwriters on it. Because you might as well not even be on the record. Yeah, I mean, they're hard to even find. Like, when you get that, it's right. hard to find. And meanwhile, <clears throat> the amount, the the sink or swim part of when someone says it's a, it's a, it's going to be a single, it's going to be a single, and it ends up on a, on a, as a bonus track, it's like that happens more often than you think because the writer, the artist has... They're going to write eight songs, and the last two slots are really for the singles. Right. And if you're the third, then they make you the bonus track. Right. And if you're the second, you're the second single. Right. You know, it's exactly. like it's that different of a, either you're going to make enough money for a long time or you're going to end up uh, and I had searching false. for the deluxe album. Right. At, you know, in exactly at Target. You know, and that's what Target. I was doing. But I had this, I didn't really know how it worked. So I had this false hope that. There's still a chance that it could come out, you know. Right. So, I packed up and moved to LA, and thought that based off of of like that song, I would no problem be able to get a publishing deal and meetings and sessions. I mean, here I am. I mean, it with- does show <clears throat> an insane amount of potential if you're a, somebody in Miami who's writing a song at 18 years old that ends up on a yeah, so that ends up on a Beyonce record. That's uh, I don't know if it really helped because, I mean, at that point I didn't really. I was working with um, a manager, Marilyn, but we, sh- but within like a year into living in LA, we parted ways. She was in Miami, so I didn't really, you know, Jim and I decided that we would stop working together. But I, the only connections that I really had were the connections with from the writing camp that he put on with David Ryan Harris and Steve wow. McEwen. So David Ryan Harris and I became really close. And I think that <clears throat> even though Jim and I like had kind of agreed that like we'd go our separate ways, I kind of still rode off of like, you know, I I just I had to get in with David Ryan Harris. So I had to do what I had to do. What like, did David Ryan Harris do? He David Ryan Harris was um John Mayer's guitar player okay. and wrote stuff with him and He's written a bunch of stuff. One of the most incredible writers. I would love to go back and work with him. Um, he is a, a artist project as well. The most incredible, just soul, just would break your heart, his voice. And so we spent like a few months just pushing and um, making a demo for myself. And there was one so this song. Was, you moved here to be a, the, an artist yeah. at this point. Mm-hmm. And, and then are you, are you at this point, had you... Are you, are you doing a long distance relationship or had- sort of? Uh-huh. And yeah, so that was, yeah, I wasn't, I mean, I needed, it was so scary. Like I've moved in with my stepmom's cousin who I had only met once. And I mean, it was a nice situation, but it, you know, I was just, this is my first time like 
being away and I don't know anyone. And yeah, it was really tough. It was the, oh God. Yeah. I was kind of just commuting. I rented a car commuting back and forth from David Ryan Harris's house. And we made some, we made some shit songs. And then we made one that is called Lonely Won't Come Around that ended up on Crystal Power Socks' album. And Crystal Power Socks, I think like won first or second place in American Idol. Wow. So it was a big deal. Yeah. She was actually really rad. She's like dreadlocks and cool chick from like, I don't know where, but somewhere. <laughs> and like <laughs> from like the boondocks. And but a cut, I mean, at that point, a cut's a cut, and, cuts and that's cut. what people are buying. Still, still, people are buying albums or singles or anything. So you know, I'm sure it pops up in some different places. Oh, yeah. You know, I love that tune. Um, and uh, yeah, so from that point, <clears throat> actually, Jim Johnson started to get kind of excited. I sent him that song, um, <clears throat> but it was still like. There was still, you know, there was just, he had so much shit going on with B.O.B. and like, you know, just, he was in Miami and it just was too tough. So I, um, I was still working with my manager, Marilyn, and by chance, she, um, set me up on a meeting with Tom Maffei, who managed me for about four years and he was at Pulse then. Um, I had took a meeting with him and, um, he listened to all my demos and he, that's kind of where I made the um, shift from aspiring artist to aspiring songwriter. He told me that it's it makes more sense. Like my my voice was just it. Well, I didn't have the thing. Like it just I had yeah. I I wasn't I didn't have my identity sorted out. I was just kind of just scrambled. I couldn't really write from a personal perspective. And why? I don't know. You'd think it wasn't till a lot later that I was able to do that. Honestly, like it had really is wasn't until like the past two years that I've been able to tap into that place once I got sober. Um, well, we haven't really reached that point yet. So Tom Fay managed me. He put me in a session with his dude radio and Jorgen Ellefson. At this point, I don't have a publishing deal. Um, I'm pretty like strapped for cash. Like my dad, like it's looking, I mean, I thought about getting like extra jobs. So I'm like, I, I just didn't know what to do. When you were saying you were, you were starting to say your dad, it was your dad cutting you off at that point. Well, yeah, I mean, it was like, of... I'd been out in LA for about a year and a half and like, and you know, but I was willing to do whatever I had to do. Did they understand? I, I don't know what your, your family situation is. Did they understand what you were doing? Oh there? yeah. I had the most supportive parents and, and my mom, you know, was the reason why I'm, she, you know, commuted me back and forth to Miami to work with Marty Centrone from No Mercy, like right. after school every day, just doing it. And thank God for that, because I wanted to play soccer and go surf with my friends and smoke pot and shit and like did not want to do anything related to music. But she pushed me in a positive way. And yeah, so... Um, when when I so you start working with Jurgen Olofsson, or the first time you meet Jurgen, and and you know just some background, he wrote, "You drive me crazy," and a sometimes, like this, and sometimes a moment like this, mm-hmm. like <clears throat> some pretty massive songs. So you get in with someone like that. That's other than Jim Johnson, he probably has you know the biggest credits. Oh, yeah. I assume you know. It was an, I was so intimidated, but I luckily, you know, his weakness was my strong point and which was lyrics and I had just prior to that session I had just written so much shit just like concepts and lyrics and stories and all this stuff and and I walk in and we write we write a song and it comes out really quickly I can't even remember the song but he asked me at that point he's like you know I'd love for you to come out to Sweden and write with me for you know a month or so and I'm like yeah, that'd be great, but like, I don't, I'm like, yeah. I can't ask my dad for any more cash. I'm like, he's like, do you have a publisher? And I'm like, no. He's like, great, I'll sign you to my publishing deal, blah, blah, blah. We signed a publishing deal, and I was out in Sweden, and that's when it started. Wow. Yeah. At that point, did you split off from Jim Johnson, like yeah. officially? Mm-hmm. Is that Was that an amicable separation? Yeah. yeah, it was, we're still great. I mean, I've so, he's taught me a lot. A lot. I mean, he he really took a chance with me and and wanted to you know wanted to potentially push me in into doing what Bob did, but I just wasn't ready. And um, I have so much respect for him and that whole crew. And um, but but yeah, it was good. I mean, 
I was ready to just kind of do my own thing. And Were you able to separate at that point with your ex? Is that when that like officially separates or is that still being dragged out? Um, let's see. It was, it was, yeah, it was still. Still being dragged out. Yeah. It was still being dragged out. I remember, yeah. I was in Sweden and, and, um, I knew there was, sh- I mean, it just got even more shady. <clears throat> the you know, the further you get, though, I imagine that, you know, uh, it's probably, well, you know, your family, your friends, and this guy must be like, here <clears throat> Here you are in Los Angeles. Not that Miami is a small town, but you're in Los Angeles. Seems like you're killing it. You have songs out with Beyonce, even if they're on, you know, some deluxe, and you're about to go to Sweden because you're signing a publishing deal with one of the wasn't biggest that, songwriters. Were people like in awe, or was it sort of like it nah, hadn't it's happened just- yet? It was. It wasn't until stronger. So, I, I mean, and we're talking like seven years with this one person, and like, and I just couldn't imagine my life without him, as f- dysfunctional as it was. And I didn't really have many friends in LA at all. Like it was, yeah. A year and a half in, I was just still trying to find my way. And so um, when I was in Sweden, fuck, man, we we were grinding. That was, it was in the winter time and it was, it was tough. And, it's black. Oh. I think people don't realize in Sweden during the winter, there is no sun. No. There's sun maybe between 11.30 a.m. and 1.45 p.m. during the height of winter. Yeah, and there's like a significant age difference between Jorgen and I. And so I didn't really, I mean, I was just kind of out there by myself and I was staying down. Was that the weird? Sh- no, because I mean, I, I he was like a dad in a way. It was, you know, I stayed with him and his family and his wife and his daughter who I loved and who I love. And I'm just, but I'm still like, you know, my only like stability was stability, quote unquote, was Ryan back home, and and um and I just thought that that was, you know, enough for me to whatever it was, it was enough for me to like not feel alone, you know, to have someone to call in who's in the industry. You mean, or no? No, no, just no in Ryan. General. Yeah, Wait. just. Oh. Ryan was a boyfriend, so he oh, was like right. so the reason why I stayed. Oh, was I like, see, I see. Okay, yeah, just because it felt like I had a purpose, you know, I was I was somebody to someone, right? And yeah, so it, I we come back from Sweden, and Jorgen comes to LA. Um, now at this point, this is about a month after I'm about twenty years old at this point, almost twenty one, still with Ryan. Until um, it was like 4th of July weekend. My mom was out visiting me. I didn't go back to Florida that weekend because I had some work to do. My mom came out and that was the weekend that Ryan met his girlfriend that he's with now. So that and that was the night I got a call that he had been seeing that there was something like I should be worried about and. And I saw some pictures were posted. Oh. So this, the, the on July fifth, I, I woke up with all this shit, and then I had to prepare for a session in Long Beach with David Gamson and Jorgen Ellefson. And I'm like all out of sorts. Like I couldn't even drive to the session. I'm like I was so close to canceling that session. You have no idea. It's in Long Beach. Like, I mean. That alone is enough to cancel the session. It's so funny. It's in his back house. Yes. You know? I'm like, yeah. what the fuck? Yeah. So my mom, luckily, Shout my mom to happened to be there for he's sure. <laughs> um, and I, my mom was like, we got to do this, you know, because she's not letting me do cancel. So she drove me to Long Beach. And she, we're listening, we're talking, and she's like, you know, Allie, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I was like in the, the passenger seat, curled over, like just kill me, then leave me here. I can't take it. And so we pull up at the session, and like <laughs> David Gamson comes out with like coconuts and shit, like like have some coconut water, and the dogs there. It's like okay. <laughs> so we sit down. We're going through concepts. Jorgen's tough. Like Jorgen, when he you know he'll drill and drill and drill, and you better come with the concept. 
So we're going through shit. And I'm like, I don't know. What doesn't really make stronger? It's like a bit gimmicky. Like I know Kanye said it, but like, ooh. and I know it's, you know, the famous Nietzsche quote. And, um, but I was just like, I, I had to get that session wrapped up. I was like, we got to get, I was like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's it. Bingo. <clears throat> so yeah, we wrote that tune. Who sings that melody? But, uh, nah, 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 nah. That's actually Jorgen. And then I came in with the We fought over that melody big time. We had to take a walk around the block. We had to do it literally. We had to take a cool off. Because luckily David Gamson had my back. He's like, that's great. We got I love that. We got to keep that. The me, myself, and I. Did uh, you um, know that it was a great song? Or was it like at this point you've been writing for a while um, and you've done a lot of songs. You're not even in the mindset. You, right now you're, it's distracting you from what's going on in your personal life. Right. Well, no, because we had a... Um, a sketch demo and I laid it down and I was like, yeah, it's cool. David Gamson had a demo singer come in. This girl, Chanel can sing oh, yeah. her ass Crazy. off, man. And David Gamson produced the song up, had her voice on it. And I got, I got it sent to me and I was like, oh shit. It's awesome. This is awesome. Like this feels great. And then nothing really kind of panned out. I played it for a few. I'm not going to like lay anybody out there on the line, but I did play it for a few A and R's, and they passed on it for Leona Lewis and and um, Jeff Aldridge, Jim Valutato, and Jeff Aldridge. Um, Jeff Aldridge is with uh, RCA at the time, and um, I think right. Yeah, something. he was. Yeah, and um, Jim Valutato is my publisher at Sony because I did the Junction deal, whatever. And so Jim Valutato. I mean, back in Sweden, we get a call from Jeff Aldridge and Jim Valletado. Kelly Clarkson loves the record. She's going to cut it. We're going to get it to Greg Kirsten. He's going to produce it. And we changed the verse a couple times, and it ended up going back to the original verse. Kelly tweaked a few lyrics on the verses, didn't take any publishing, is a legend to me, like just the fucking coolest artist in the game. And um, I was able to go in and 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 watch her record it with Greg Kirsten. So, so you were there during that. That's when that's when I started to get my groove back. <laughs> I wish all artists saw how Kelly works cuz because she's such a good writer when she writes that she accepts like when she's the songwriter and when she's the artist cutting an outside song and she treats songwriters with such immense oh, respect. Yeah. She's awesome, man. I mean, I I actually got to know her for, I mean, I'd met her a few times, but I really got to know her um, a couple months ago in Nashville. And yeah, she's just, she's really in, intelligent. She has no filter and she's just the most down to earth. I mean, I'd love to hang out with her more. And, and like, you know, we have a similar perspective on life and and religion and politics. She's just badass, man. She's, it's, I mean, it's really nice to see. Like, I, I'd love to like, you know, that song obviously means the world to me, but now that I really know her, I'm going to really try and, and nail some more on her record. How does that song go from, you know, even Greg Kirsten, she cuts it, you know, you were told Beyonce's song was going to be a single, ends up as a deluxe. This one, you hear how good she sounds on this song. You know, I mean, how how confident were you at that time when you heard her sing, like, oh, this is a shoe in Or were you sitting there being skeptical i mean when did how does this become it's the biggest song on all radio formats in the u.s it's all over commercials it just it's it becomes this cash machine right well yeah i mean there wasn't when she was recording it i was like yeah we got this no problem i mean i didn't i had never been through like you know the trials and tribulations of like getting a song out and making sure it's a single because now i know that things can change on the fly so um, there was actually another, we were, we were pretty sure it was going to be first single, but something changed and Esther Dean, Brett James and Brian Kennedy wrote Mr. Know-It-All. And so that kind of, that hit hard because when Mr. Know-It-All came out, I just, I was like, you, I don't know. I had this idea about the first single. The first single is what you want ultimately, right? 
Um, and then you, you don't if the as long as the first single does pretty well and it opens the door for this is the next project, you actually kind of want the second one, right? Every time, but it's you. You can't convince any songwriter in the world that that's the case. No, no. Well, especially at that point. I mean, I was pretty devastated and like, yeah, it was a nail biter. And at that point, like Spotify started to to come up. So it hadn't really been, it it was just the beginning, I felt like, of Spotify. And um, so the people were still buying single, buying off iTunes at that point. Um, So I just made off, made that cut, that cutoff point. And, um, are you feeling pressure to repeat at that point? I mean, how soon after when Stronger is huge are you feeling like, oh, I got to have a follow up to this? Yeah, like in, immediately. And that's where, I mean, I rode that high. <laughs> I rode that high until I hit rock bottom. It's weird. There's like this victory lap syndrome that I, I kind of think all songwriters go through when they have their first hit. Where it's everyone starts calling you, all the great artists, great labels, great writers, everyone, producers, they're all calling you to congratulate you. They all want you in the room. And it's so easy to just schedule yourself to, you know, to lose your mind. And it's, it's sometimes impossible to, the celebrating is nonstop because you're just like, Dinners and right. dinners, oh, and yeah. drinks oh, and yeah. parties, and everybody's like they want you there. You you suddenly become, you know, you're not wanting to go in this session because you're in the car crying, and then you show up, you write the biggest song in the world, and all of a sudden, what happens? I wasn't equipped. I definitely, I, I didn't really have the relationships I have now with other writers and producers, and um. I mean, I I was going into rooms, but I was just still testing the water. So I didn't know who I liked working with because I was only working with Jorgen for a really long time. So we tried to to maintain consistency, but it's tough when he's going back and forth from Sweden. I'm getting pulled. I'm starting to see this whole other side of this industry that's like the, you know, the <laughs> the fast and furious life of like, you know, fame and recognition and I'm you know I I get hooked on a date uh blind I get set up on a, bla- a blind date with Mike El- from Mike Elizondo um to meet James Valentine who I dated for a couple years so it's just like it's where I'm a, I'm in the fast lane like it's yeah. going and it's and um are you writing or are I, yeah, you just are I was you... writing I definitely was but I just didn't have I just didn't know. Like, I just didn't... Nothing was really sticking. I mean, there was. Like, I got a bunch of album cuts. Like, I did... Um, and there was incredible things that happened. And you end up on X Factor, right? I end up on X yeah. Factor. I I have a... I mean, L.A. Reid um, signed me to a big song deal there, and I wrote with Sierra. There was a lot of great things. L.A. Reid introduced me to Simon, and Simon and I click. Like we're, Cole. yeah. And, yeah. and we, I learned a lot from Simon and, and I was fascinated by him. I mean, he's just, he's brilliant and he's fucking cool and he likes to party and he's like, and I just, I, I hung around that whole scene for like four or five mon- months. He wanted me to judge the X Factor. So I started going through the rounds of auditions with these, with uh, Fox producers and, yeah, I, I mean, I got really close. It was between me and Paulina Rubio, and thank God that did not happen. Why? I was not ready for that. Why? Was, that was like the beginning of of the end of my my party era. What's your partying era? What do you mean by that? Um, well, it's just really started with like the late nights. It was booze. It was like you know rosé and. and Adderall and shit here and there. It wasn't really. I didn't get heavy into drugs. Um, when did you know you had a problem? When I couldn't write a song without a good buzz. Wow. For about six months, yeah. So we're talking like waking up and yeah. I mean, the thermos was filled with some rosé. So stronger happens in 2012 or right. so, uh-huh. and then when does this period of 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 
the I'd partying say, stop? When does X Factor stop? When did when do you 2014, start 15. So those yeah. like two, three years you're yeah. kind of still riding the high and away from stronger. Right. And when I started working on the X, I didn't get the, the position obviously as a judge, but he, Simon hired me as his, um, like the, the consultant for his, for his acts. Sure. So I was kind of getting like the special treatment, which I got to like hang out in his dressing room and I had his full attention all the time. And like, right. so we were kind of, and it was, I got to drink wine and champagne in his dressing room. But then, I mean, that, that, and that's like four months of like me, I, I wasn't writing at all. I'm just like focused on, you know, building, like making sure that Simon, groups win and and like the choosing the best songs and it was fun julian bonetta and john ryan and like a bunch of my homies were there and it was just a big fucking party i mean we were all going for it like just the wine i mean the wine and the the coffee cups i mean i i hope that we were all going for it i think right, <laughs> we yeah, were exactly. all going for it <laughs> <laughs> i was definitely right going for, for sure it. but it was it was there was a lot of stress in that like Fuck, man, and and did after- somebody say to you like, "Hey, you're a songwriter, you should do that," or did somebody say you you're drinking too much, or was it no. a, a personal thing of I kind of think I want to go back into sitting in a booth and writing? Yeah, it was that, and I and I think that straight after the X Factor is when I realized that there's something wrong because I was starting to crave the the hot, the the uh, the buzz, you know, right. And um, we about a month after X Factor, we started working on Alex and Sierra's album, and yeah, I find I found myself slipping into the same routine of like just drinking and drinking, and I felt like the king of the world though when I was doing it. It was just like the Adderall. There was like a weird chemical balance between the Adderall and the the rosé that just like was like fucking heroin to me i feel like whatever heroin is but like just this like complete bliss of like nirvana and um and i mean that would only that feeling only lasts for like a few hours and then it gets pretty dark but yeah and and so i mean it just you can't sustain with that i just couldn't sustain because i felt like how did you when you went you start going to rehab or did you just quit i just quit um i hired a sober coach to come stay with me for about two weeks and um and yeah I mean I just started going into the meetings and I mean I'd watched Jay Cash's journey I lived with um Jay Cash for a few months and and his wife Jamie Zellick was a really is a really good friend of mine and um yeah they really they really helped me get through it and get sober and I mean I watched I was like you know at the tail end of my my era with that shit and I was watching Jay Cash just fly, you know, like his, he's happy and he's consistently writing great songs and he's like on top and he doesn't have to, and I'm there and like make, like mixing a drink in the kitchen, like, you know, all right, there's, there's something and I, without any cuts, without any cuts, you know, the phone isn't ringing for a couple months. Um, and then, I mean, I was I dabbled in like consulting for Columbia Records for a year and a half, learned a lot there and but once I got sober, had the sober coach come in, it was when my life completely changed. Like, and that, and right after that's right when you is that when the Cedric Gervais thing happened? Like, prior. That was before I got sober. So right after that. Wow. So when you listen to uh, the Cedric Gervais one wasn't really a hit, but it was a single where it features you. I mean, right. was that? I don't even listen to it. <laughs> do, sorry, because it pulls you back to that moment. Yeah, it it was a dark place that time. But um, how do you then from from being sober, which has now been a few years, right? Yeah, almost um, two years. Did you immediately meet your co-writers on, you know, Brian Lee and, it was about and Andrew Watt? Four or months, was... four months into the into, you know, because I had to like get my bearings back on. Did I you had have to... a new manager, new publisher. Not I mean, yet. Like, not yet. You know. um, but I had, I mean, I had to relearn how to write a song without that was that was my biggest motivation. Right. I mean, how long can you go into a session like, and and like discreetly be drunk? 
I mean, I was getting away with it. 90% of the time I was buzzed. So like that's, I didn't know myself sober. I had no fucking clue. I was going into business meetings, killing it, closing deals, making money like that, but just waking up in the morning and forgetting what the fuck happened. So. Because it's all a party. It's it, all you, a party. You're just trying to keep that going on. Yeah, yeah. I was having a fucking great time. I mean, and everybody was loving me and my energy and like, I just, I felt on the top of the world. And, and so. Now, like, yeah, I mean, I just I had to get my bearings back on. And I met Andrew Watt into like four months into that, um, into being sober. And, and through that, I had amazing friend Stephen Rabel sober now and just starting to really get his career. And he's taking off and and Bonnie McKee, you know, going to meetings and just we I had a great support system that really encouraged me what like you know reading about Sia and her journey it's just like obviously there's something to this thing like right you know we've noticed that we you know we've done uh just over a dozen interviews and I think we've figured something like 70 80 percent of the guests that we've had have are sober you know wow. that it can't be it can't be a coincidence that people who are addicted or have an addictive personality also are creative are addicted to working right yeah and they're they the have only they're emotional a lot of them are probably were suppressing emotion and then this is how they let it out once they're finally sober yeah you know i mean i know you can relate to this absolutely i mean you know. i i feel like i've kind of shifted my addiction into into music which is i'm trying to balance out now but there's something i finally get that high off of like flowing off, you know, on the mic or just catching onto a good lyric. And when I met Andrew Watt and Brian Lee, um, the first session we did, we wrote, let me love you. So that's the first session. Yep. The first, you gotta be kidding, I'm not me. kidding, man. Like, and that feeling was just like, did okay. you know it was a hit then? It felt yeah, like right? it. Yeah. I mean, I know there was a bidding war for that song. Right. I know. You know I mean, it went on for like about, close to a year until it was until it actually came out um but yeah we we when did justin bieber hear it um, after it was produced out or did he hear after it after it then... was produced yeah and andrew watt like he andrew watt like is the main like he facilitated that whole yeah, what a hustler man. yeah he's, he's, amazing. he's a different breed yeah, dude yeah, i sure. think he's gonna run this fucking industry at some point he almost is so i feel like when and he had a relationship with Justin. Justin heard it, cut it, and and but throughout that time, like Brian and Andrew and I, just we had magic there. And yeah, how soon after that did you write "It Ain't Me"? Um, we wrote "It Ain't Me" about a uh, six months after it came after "Let Me Love You" came out. So, so you guys become kind of a writing team yeah. for almost two years. Yeah, and we, I mean, we were. We went to London, worked on Rita Ora. We had been, I mean, there's just, it just happens. Like we write a song and if it felt like something, like it would, you know, it would get cut. And Are you like, guys considered a writing team now? I mean, uh, it's kind of like, hard not to. Yeah, but we, you know, we're all kind of in different, like when we're all in the same city, there's nothing, there's like, those are the most enjoyable sessions for me. Even like, even if we like, are all in different places mentally. Like it's just, it, there's a love there that like you can't mess with. And we all bring like the sessions are there, you know, we all challenge each other in, in ways, but it's when we, when we catch that rhythm, when we're all like contributing lyrics and having ideas and we feel it and we're just, it's, there's nothing like that. So I, I owe a lot of like, like gaining that high back to those guys because they they pushed me and they really built my confidence back up and I really needed it. Like so, um, when when you your first session with them, I mean that that melodies has a moment that the, sorry going back to let mm -hmm. me love you. You know, um, it's the uh, the the na 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 part where mm -hmm. you end on the the dissonance after the first round, which allows you to resolve it and mm -hmm. all this other stuff. Is that uh, I mean, using words like na 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 is a is a choice. Mm -hmm. Sticking with that melody is a choice. Mm -hmm. I know Brian's like a virtuosic melody writer. Yeah, he went know? for that. Let's pull it down on the second one. I mean, he kind of he was pushing that. Um, 
him and Andrew kind of constructed that chorus melody thing. And then I jumped into the booth and and kind of was freestyling the the lyrics and, and going for so it. Crazy. So crazy. It was just... Same thing with It Ain't Me? Is that sort of the same process um, you guys have? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it Ain't Me happens so fast that like it it blows my mind. I mean, we were just, we were in a session with Kygo and we kind of started something else that wasn't too good. And then Brian picked up the guitar and started playing something and was going off of this melody. Andrew came in at that point, started tweaking it. We started going and then the melodies, it was just like we were on that chorus and, and Brian and I were kind of charging at that melody and Andrew came in and tweaked. It was just like, it, it was just magic. Like it, that song needed to come out of all of us. Like it relates to all of us in so many different ways that it's it's like all of our story in one song. And it was like just this beautiful combination of like Fleetwood Mac with like just, I don't know, just with just honesty and, and like – uh, just that song was, yeah, that was, that was a big moment for us. And I, and I remember like the, when Kygo came in the room and, and listened to it for the first time right after we had written it and like just watched his eyes kind of like, okay. It just lit up. Yeah. It was just. Is, um, is it hard to, you guys are all in very different places when it comes to celebrating. <laughs> The three of you are so, so different. Right. And not to get into too much of that, but is it hard to be, is it hard the way you guys are? Because, I mean, that the dynamic of the three of you probably is what makes you guys very special. Mm-hmm. But you're talking about sort of extremes per, in personalities. Right. I mean, you would think, but I've just kind of been able to, manage it and they they have respect for me especially in the writing process like uh, for the most part i mean we're all like there's we're not getting fucked up in the studio they're, they're obviously i'm not but they're not drinking around and if we go out to dinner we go you know we have a you know we'll have a it's like feels like a family thing and then if, when i'll hang out for as long as i can and i mean there's only like only so much i can do like i'm not i mean that I've had such an incredible run being sober and my life has completely changed. I'm like the happiest I've ever been. So I, you know, I'm not, I can't be pulled back into that world. I mean, and so I kind of go home and, and I'm, yeah, I mean, this has been the best, best year of my life. Honestly, I have a fucking wonderful, incredible boyfriend right now that's just like helped me connect to other human beings sober and and like find my truth and like just just opens up my mind to so many different things in in the world and and just you know he's so I'm just like in a really solid place and just like I know we could go into talking about things like religion and spirituality yes. and the planet and politics oh, yeah. because I know you have opinions with all these things right. Um, but I could really easily get myself into like a. I know black we we will we'll have, like, we'll, we'll have well, to do a follow up, right? But bef- before we <laughs> and I want I'm gonna do like uh, I'm gonna just list five things. We don't are have we any... already did, are we already at the time? No, we're, we're not. We okay. have no time. We can keep going <laughs> no, if you want. But let's. Don't I'm just gonna the, list. Everybody's too bad at this point. <laughs> we do this segment. Um, hey, this is about you. Oh, thank you. Know? You know, no, this was really so, good. This is like but, a really necessary release for me. I good. Got, I haven't spoken about this in a re- like all these. Well, this is important. Uh, it's it, this is important for a number of reasons for your story, but I, I, we'll get to that still in one second. I'm going to list five things. You're just going to name the first thing that comes off the top of your head. It's a segment we don't have any title for. It's called Five Things That I'm Going to Just List, and you're going to name a bunch of shit <clears> that <throat> okay, comes to your head. Okay, <clears throat> you're going to listen. Magnificent. Simon Cowell. Gangster. The co-producers of this podcast, your managers, David and Jeremy. Ooh, fucking, like, hold on. David, um, sorry, David Silverstein. David and Silverstein Levin. and Jeremy Levin. My heroes. My saviors. I love that. Brian Lee. Ooh. The, the, um, I'd say the, the god of, like, the god of the rebels. Let's do that. Oh, I like that. Andrew Watt. Ooh. And my best friend, my best friend, my, the fucking pioneer. Oh, I like that. 
I, I think what, if if people don't know who Andrew Watt is, they should pioneer. They should figure legend. out first of all Brian Andrew, Lee. Andrew, and Andrew Watt Arr, is a legend. Yeah, Brian Lee is the god of the rebels. Yeah, I love that. Andrew Watt is is is, is uh, a, 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 a a such an important personality that is just starting in the music. Industry. Oh yeah, he's gonna run it. Yeah, for sure. It's really impressive. He is genius, genius, genius. But I was gonna say, you know, you're. Your story is so inspiring in the music industry because some there are people who who were in your position who climbed the top of the mountain, came back down, and that was the end. And they weren't able to figure it out. That is the story. That is the story of so many artists, so many writers, so many producers. There's so few people who went, climbed a mountain, came back down, and then climbed a bigger mountain. I mean, you are running on. This is a a massive run for you because you are opening up, honestly, not just musically by doing things like this. You know, you're you're giving back. You're acknowledging all the people who are involved in your career. And when you talk about the beginning of this conversation, you're saying how you have this ego, and you walk up to these two huge producers in the street of Miami and be like, "Yeah, I'm going in the studio." Versus now where you're you're like, I owe this with, to, you know, David and Jeremy are my, my heroes mm-hmm. and these guys are my saviors. Mm-hmm. And with, you know, Cash and Jamie, that they're oh, like, they, all these wonderful people that you've, uh, that are embracing your journey because you're a really positive influence to, to a lot of people here. Thanks. So, that means a lot. you know, yeah, it's a, I'm super grateful to be in this place right now. So it's been a, it's been a journey for yeah. sure, but it feels worth it. So, well, thank you for doing this. We'll do a follow up in, you know, two years from now <laughs> when you, you know, it's seven <laughs> talk, more we'll songs We'll talk Cosmos. <laughs> oh yeah. hundred percent. All right. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank okay. you. Thanks for listening to this episode of And The Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us on iTunes. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter. And The Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to Jeff Sparger, David Silberstein from Mega House Music, and Michael White. Here's a sneak peek of next week's And the Writer Is. When I met Bon Jovi, they they had a, you know a very dynamic, legendary manager Doc McGee, and so somehow you know I I got a chance to go and write with them. They had had kind of a not so um, successful second record, 7,800 Fahrenheit or something like that. Yeah. And um, I went out to New Jersey and a, rent a car because I was living in New York. And we went to the Richie's parents' house, which, there, which is where they were co-writing in the basement. And um, I got their little house and it was in a, kind of like at the end of this little cul-de-sac and behind them was Marsh's. And at the very, like, far away were the refineries, the oil refineries. Like, it was Emerald City over there. Can you imagine how toxic this place is? Yeah. You know? And so I walk in. I make a left. I look to my left. There's a room, and that's Richie's room. Poster of Kiss, Farrah Fawcett in the, you know, red bathing suit. You know, typical, you know, high school boy's room. And then... You're right there in the kitchen, and John was on the wall phone, like this avocado green wall phone. And he's kind of like, you know, kind of waves to me. And Richie, who's very, very nice and, you know, you know, very, very accommodating, was said, well, uh, why don't you just come downstairs and, you know, I'll set you up, you know, for our session. And so, you know, I went down there, and it was the laundry room with like, you know, it was literally the laundry room with some transoms, like muddy transoms, around the side and then um for my an old formica table that must have been retired from the kitchen and this little keyboard that was kind of teetering on it some amps buzzing and finally 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 john came down 
He was obviously doing big business on the phone, whatever. Um, and um, I had a title in my back pocket. So we started fooling around, you know, writing this and that and the other thing. And I said, okay, I guess I better pull out the, the title. The title was You Give Love a Bad Name. Because I love, you know, I haven't talked about my mentor, Bob Crew, but he taught me about writing songs that have a lot of inner rhyming and irony. And having, once you have a title that has, tells it all, the song just spills out of it, like a magic spell. And so John instantly responded, and he had had a song on his previous record called Shot Through the Heart. So he doesn't give up on his good material either. And uh, so, you know... Uh, you know, he's, he just instantly said, shot through the heart, and you're to blame. Darling, you give love a bad name. And, and, and the rest is history. Until next time, this is Ross Golan.